All right, we're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. And uh, my goal uh, in these sessions right now are that we'll get through chapters 3 and chapters 4 and possibly through chapter number 5. So uh, over the next uh, couple, two and a half hours, I'll be recording these uh, chapters and the various material that we find in them. But before we get going, let me just kind of give you a little bit of a review. I'll be using uh, the authorized version of Scripture, the AV 1611. Notice that in your notes, assuming you have a notebook, that the text is included in the notes. That way you can read the notes. You can take them with you wherever you go. If you're going off to Starbucks and you want to do a little studying or a little reading, you'll always have it, have the text with you in the notebook. And my intention is to follow the notebook, so uh, I'm doing that just uh, to keep everybody in order. I will not jump around in the notebook, won't try to confuse you or uh, do that even accidentally. I'm doing about 30-minute segments right now, which gives you uh, and gives me a little bit of a break in between. That can be used for questions and answers or just a, a break of some kind for you and for your facilitator. The book of Acts covers about 35 years of history. The book of Acts is, a, is really a history book. We see the uh, life of Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but then we see the life of the apostles in the early church in the, probably the first 55, 60 years are recorded um, after the death of Christ are recorded in the book of Acts. The book is primarily transitional. We've noted that in the past. It takes us from the life of Christ into the church, it takes us from an emphasis on the nation of Israel into an emphasis uh, on the church. Um, it sets forth the actions, acts, the actions of the apostles, the first generation church. In the first half of the book, the primary spokesperson is Peter, the apostle. In the second half of the book, we find Paul, who originally is found as Saul, his name being changed. Uh, we find Paul is the primary spokesperson or character. Peter's name occurs about 58 times in the book of Acts, but only one time after chapter number 12. Saul, or Paul's name, occurs about 157 times, 141 times after Acts chapter number 12. We've already gone through chapters 1 and 2, and we've gone through them slowly because we've laid a foundation for the rest of the book. Uh, as we go through these uh, subsequent lessons, we'll be moving a little bit more quickly now that we have established a foundation for the book. If you would, take your notebook and go to pages one, two, three, four, and just be reminded of the um, uh, table of contents that we have there. I think I said this uh, in a previous session that there's about 200 different entries on these pages. Several of them, about 40 of them, are introductions to the particular material that will follow. So that leaves us with about 150 or 160 different events that we're singling out to look at through the book of Acts. Again, the book of Acts is a history book. If you look there in uh, page number one in your table of contents, you can go back and see essentially what we have covered thus far. Acts 1 through 8, the characteristics of true discipleship, the first 35 years, the first emboldened entry, the second, the baton is passed. That took us through the beginning part of chapter 1. And then the upper room prayer meeting and business meeting, that finished the first chapter. Then we looked at um, two other uh, major entries, Pentecost and the first Christian church. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 28, and then 29 through 47, which takes us down to about the middle of the page there, Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. So let's look at chapter 3, just kind of get it in our heads here before we go and uh, read the text and uh, comment on the text as we go along. Acts chapter 3, Peter heals the paralytic. We're going to see the first healing here in the book of Acts, 
And of course, as we mentioned, Peter is the primary, the main character in these first several chapters. Um, we see the healing in the first 11 verses, and then Peter preaches Jesus Christ to the wandering crowd. People are trying to figure out what has just happened here. Apparently, miracles as we understand them uh, didn't happen every day and in every place. Uh, everybody wasn't praying for their own miracle, like oftentimes I hear some of our television evangelists say. I don't think they were as common as we might think. Uh, we read of the miracles of Jesus in um, the Gospels, of course, and we'll comment on them a little bit later when we talk about this particular healing event and what the Bible teaches about healing. Then Peter preaches to the men of Israel. The focal point is still on Israel. Remember, this is a transitional book. This is taking us from the gospel ministry, primarily of the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ, taking us into what becomes what we know as the church age. But this book, again, is transitional. So Peter is still dealing with unbelieving Israel at this time, and he preaches in chapter 3, 19 through 26, to them and tries to get them or bring them on board and help them to understand what they have just done in rejecting their Messiah. So then we will go on beyond that. We'll see in chapter number four. We won't spend any time now, but in chapter number four, we'll see the first church persecutions and, of course, many to follow. So I'm going to ask if you would, uh, in your notebook, if you go down to about page number 50, We've covered the first, I believe, the first 49 pages or 48 pages, and that's going to take us to Acts chapter number 3, where it says at the top of page 49, the title there is Peter Heals the Paralytic. I mentioned uh, earlier in a previous lesson that I like to review, and I'm not going to review the whole book every time we start a new section, but we're still kind of getting ourselves established in the book of Acts. So I would like you, just for a moment, as we went back and looked at the table of contents, you can see the general outline of chapter number one. You can take a moment and refamiliarize yourself with that. And then Acts chapter number two, these are the subjects that we uh, have reviewed in the past. About the middle of page 49, we want to pick up in the paragraph that begins in chapter 3. In chapter 3, we observe the first healing that takes place in the book of Acts. Obviously not the first healing. Christ uh, healed many throughout the Gospels. But the first healing in the book of Acts. We've noted, as I've said a couple times already, that this is a book of transition. At the very outset of our lesson today, I want to hear to know that I believe that God heals. I believe that God created the universe. And if God can create the universe with his word, um, God can do anything. He can do what you and I would consider to be the impossible. So when we're talking about healing, sometimes Baptists or Bible church people are given a bad rap when, they're, when they are um, represented as believing that we don't believe in healing. Of course I believe that God can heal for the reason st uh, already stated. God created the universe, so I don't have any problem with that. But the way healing is presented today in our 21st century and how healing miracles are just tossed around. As I said before, why don't you pray for your miracle today? Uh, that's really cheapening what a miracle is in Scripture. Like um, Jesus walked on water. Um, I've personally never se seen anyone do that. I believe that Jesus did that. I understand that Peter did that for a while, and then he found himself sinking into the abyss, but I've never seen anybody uh, today claim that they had the gift of healing and that they could walk on water or they could calm a storm, uh, things like that. Or, and I know of people that have claimed 
uh, I've never talked to one personally, that they claimed that they raised the dead. I had an individual in my office some years ago that claimed that uh, this individual went to a church where the pastor had claimed that he had raised several people from the dead. And that individual accused me of not being very spiritual because I didn't teach that or I hadn't raised anybody from the dead personally. Well, anyway, it was an interesting conversation, and I challenged the person to bring me, you know, any kind of documentation, any official documentation from a medical person, a newspaper article, something that I, I could believe in, that there'd be some validity or credibility to the claim that some individual was raised from the dead. Well, that individual never brought me that information, but I assume that they still believe that this pastor had raised several, I think five was the number that was given to me, had raised five people from the dead. But anyway, if you notice there in the second paragraph, at the very outset of the message, you want to hear to know that I believe that God heals and for, for the reason given. However, this does not suggest for a moment that God indiscriminately heals and gives that power or ability to all or to all believers. So here we see the outline, and we're going to pick up on page number 50. We're going to read these first three verses. Acts chapter 3, verse number 1 says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. This would be uh, the ninth hour of the day, the evening and the morning. You're looking, you're, uh, this is not the same nine o'clock in the morning that you and I would uh, assume this to be. Jewish time was uh, on a, a, a different system than the way you and I keep time, days and nights. A certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. So this kind of sets the stage for this. Now remember, the apostles, the disciples, had been given charge by Christ to heal. He had been given to them the authority, including, I might add, Judas was one of the 12 in Matthew chapter 10. We've recorded that. Notice it says, and to heal all manner of sickness. Chapter 10, Matthew 1. Verse 8 in the same chapter, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. This was given to the apostles. Luke chapter 9, notice in verse 1, to cure diseases. Verse 2, to heal the sick. Now, why were these gifts given? These gifts were given, special gifts were given to validate the ministry of the apostles and to validate the record of the truth of Christ, that Christ had given them this ability, this healing ability. It wasn't given to them just to uh, show off. It was given to validate their ministries. Remember, this is important. They didn't have a New Testament. They didn't have the book of Romans. They didn't have uh, First and Second Corinthians. They didn't have the recording of the Gospels. Uh, all they had was their personal interaction with Christ and the things that he had told them and what he had referenced in the Old Testament as being applicable to him and to his ministry. So when they went out and they healed the sick and cleansed the lepers and whatever the miracle was, it was done to validate their ministry. It wasn't just to be done at the whim of anybody. Somebody who had, you know, a backache or a headache, would you heal my headache? That wasn't for those reasons. It wasn't just to, to uh, pacify or placate people. Those miracles were done to validate the ministry of the apostles. So as Peter and John go to the temple for prayer, um, they had not quickly forgotten their Jewish roots and rituals. They happen upon a man who's been lame from birth. 
40 years is what we read in Scripture, and certainly this fellow has been, is well known uh, to all that traveled that way since verse number 2 notes that he had been laid there daily. I mean, he was part of the furniture, I suppose you might look at. They expected to see him day in and day out. Here's this lame individual, 40 years. Now, I think that it's important to say that uh, probably this, uh, the, the ministry of Christ was not unfamiliar to people at this particular time. I mean, Christ has already lived his life. He's performed miracles. He's been crucified. The resurrection story, certainly it's true, but it's rumored among many people. So there is some, some uh, uh, knowledge or awareness of the ministry of Christ. And of course, Pentecost has now uh, given the, uh, further uh, authority and credibility uh, to the apostles and to their ministries. It's important to note and I think this is very important, that the beggar was not looking or expecting to be healed. Not that he didn't want to be, but after 40 years of nothing happening, nothing that had happened to this point, I don't think that he had high hopes, hopes that this day was going to be any different than any of the other days that he laid there. What he was looking for is he was looking for a donation. He was looking, he was looking for alms. He was looking for some financial help. Because of his condition, apparently, obviously, he was not able to make a living for himself, and he really relied upon the gifts of other people just to survive. So he's looking for a gift. It's obvious from the context. Let's just go over, before we finish on page 50, let's look at the top of 51 and read those verses. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. That's what he was, he was looking for something. He's looking for a donation. Then Peter said, obviously Peter knew what he was looking for, silver and gold have I none, but such as I give thee, uh, such as I have I give thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now that's not what he was looking for, but <laughs> that was a better reward than what he sought. He took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, we know he received strength because verse 8 says he leaped, and he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. So this was the purpose of the miracle. It wasn't just to restore this individual to his health, but it was to use him as an illustration or an example of the power of God and to direct, to direct people's attention to bring praise to God. Verse 10, And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Sometimes to get the attention of people, something unusual has to take place to get people's attention. People, uh, we all are, you know, we kind of get in our ruts, our daily ruts and routines, and it takes something maybe unusual, out of the ordinary to get our attention, to com command our attention. Because we're so used to so many things happening to us throughout the day, something different, something unusual, out of the ordinary, needs to take place for most of us to stop thinking about the ordinary, the usual, the commonplace, and then get our attention to think about something else from maybe a new and a different perspective. It says that they were filled with wonder and amazement. Let's go back over to uh, page 50 at the bottom. The beggar wasn't looking or expecting to be healed. The gate of the temple called Beautiful, um, 
is a particular place. It's well known, historically documented by Josephus, the historian, and he describes it uh, in his writings and in his works. So again, this is important because we need some kind of validation that the stories that we're reading here are based on truth, historical truth and fact. So what Luke has done is he's recorded the names of people and places and maybe some events that have taken place that are documented historically, brought them into the text of the book of Acts to validate that he's just not writing an Alice in Wonderland story here. He's documenting historical fact, things that have taken place. So he references other things. He's a great historian. He references other things to bring credibility to the text. Let's go over to page 51. Underneath the text, it, is, it has been recorded. It's a Christian duty to have compassion on those who are less blessed than we. Compassion for the poor and needy has always been a characteristic of true Christianity. In fact, compassion opens doors into the lives of people. It's well known that Christians throughout history, um, particularly through modern history, have established places of uh, education, deaf schools, uh, feeding stations, hospitals, various things like that, Christians have established those to minister to the physical and personal needs of individuals to open the door to conversation, to witness to them. Now, we always don't have opportunities to build relationships with people, but I will say this. I will say that once you get to build a relationship positively with an individual, that is, you've done something for them to show your kindness, your love, your compassion towards their situation, that is, an attempt to relieve their pain and their suffering. When you do that, you kind of buy yourself or earn yourself the opportunity to uh, say more. And why do we do what we do? We do what we do as Christian people so that we might bring glory to God, that people might be amazed and wondered, that they, that lost people, saved people, would praise God for those good things, but it also opens a door of opportunity into that person's mind, heart, and soul. They start wondering why, since it's not common for human beings to reach out and to give something of yourself to another individual because it's not that common. What people will do is they'll wonder why. And of course, when they ask that question why, we certainly have an answer to that question. We do it because we love the Lord and God loves them and we're trying to do something, give of ourselves a charitable act or gift to relieve the pain and the suffering of another individual. By the way, that's the definition of compassion. In the middle of page 51, the question is asked, does God still heal? I've answered that already. There's several things that are listed there between uh, the question and the bottom of the page that uh, I've already uh, referenced or made reference to. And so we'll turn the page here and note at the top of page number 52, the gift of healing was a temporary sign gift. I believe there are at least three different kinds of gifts that are recorded, particularly throughout the book of Acts and in the New Testament. There are sign gifts. We would include in that list the gift of tongues and interpretation. Um, in Mark, uh, if you drink any deadly thing, that's a sign gift. And if you're bitten by a snake, that was a sign gift. And then the last in this list would be the gift of healing. These were sign gifts. There's also service gifts and there's speaking gifts that are spoken of in the New Testament, but our focus is on healing. Notice uh, down about the third or fourth paragraph. It says that uh, expecting to receive a donation, the paralytic 
himself is surprised by the response that they don't have money, but rise in the name of Jesus. Peter wasn't hoping this would work. He knew this would work because he was given Matthew chapter 10, Luke chapter 9, we've referenced a few moments ago, that he was given the gift of healing, a genuine gift. And look what happened when he exercised that. The healing happened immediately, completely. It says he received strength, he leaped up, stood, walked, he entered into the temple, and verse 16 references him and says there was perfect soundness. This is quite a bit different from a lot of the healing lines or healing crusades that some of the healing evangelists carry out. We don't see everybody immediately completely healed. And I would challenge someone that truly has this gift to, um, why don't you frequent children's wards and hospitals and just pass your gift out, gift out indiscriminately to everybody's there. Go down and heal them. They don't have to be looking for it. The paralytic wasn't. Do you have the real gift? If you do, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, just tell this child, whatever his malady, his disease, rise up and walk, and immediately he will, and the results are obvious. In the name of, verse 6, in Semitic thought, a name does not just identify or distinguish a person, it expresses the very nature of his being. You and I are used to naming ch our children and used to people's names. Most people don't even know what their name means. But in many cultures, even today in this world, and certainly in the Jewish culture, uh, back here in the book of Acts, when people were given a name, they were given a name because it represented something about that individual. Jesus is the Savior. He's the Christ. He is the Anointed One. He is the Lord. He is the Lord God of Heaven. Jesus Christ the Lord. His name means something. My name is George. It means something. It means farmer. I don't know that my parents named me George because they thought I would be a farmer someday. They probably named me George because my father's name was George. And my father probably didn't know what his name meant. And his father's name was George. So I think I just kind of inherited my name from my family because it was a common name. Sometimes people really think through names and name their children for, uh, for good reasons, uh, for prophetical reasons, or something about the birth, or something they hope for the child, or whatever it is. But... Um, the name Jesus Christ of Nazareth has meaning. Now notice the response, letter C on page number 52. They were filled with wonder and amazement, greatly wondering. A very practical application and lesson from the healing is that Jesus Christ brings total and complete transformation. When we're talking about our sin, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. This healing of the paralytic is a picture or a type of that, a complete healing of this individual. When you trust Christ as your Savior, it's a complete spiritual healing and a new beginning. Well, the second half of the chapter here, page number 53, near the bottom, we want to notice that Peter preaches Christ to the wondering crowd. So let's read this text, then we'll take, um, we'll take another break here in just a moment. But let's read through the text and try to get this into our heads before we come back and pick up at the bottom of page 53. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, notice he's addressing the men of Israel, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness 
we had made this man to walk. Peter is not going to take credit for the miracle. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Just put yourself in this scenario. Peter is preaching to people who have consented to the death of Jesus Christ, and he's saying, you people have crucified the Son of God. Pilate was determined to let him go, but ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer, Barabbas, to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness, perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Lots of witnesses of this. This wasn't done in a corner. It wasn't done someplace where there were no witnesses. You saw what happened. And now, brethren, I what? I know that through ignorance ye did it. He's giving them a pass here, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive unto the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto your fathers a prophet, Shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me? Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet, shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel, and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Genesis chapter 12. Unto you, first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So Peter boldly preaches to these. Remember how fearful he was, how he hid, how he wouldn't even answer the accusations of a young maiden? Look where he is now. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has totally changed him. His motivation, the cause, the purpose for his existence. Peter's fishing days, I think, are about over. Let's take a break.